Hello, my name is Chris Barkley. Today I want to go through an introduction to J.R.R. Tolkien, the man himself, and put him in context with the modern world. I want to talk about his reflection of and reaction to the modern world, and also I want to talk about the impact of his life and the um, and modern literature on his works, and also the way in which his works have impacted uh, modern literature as well. But I'd like to start with um, a particular picture that is one of my favorite pictures of J.R.R. Tolkien. So if you take a look at this, it's kind of typical of Tolkien that it's got a um, pipe, that he's got a pipe in his mouth, but it's the smile, I think, that uh, makes it my particular favorite picture. Um, he was very much a congenial person, one who uh, liked um, society and uh, friendships, and this is all reflected in his work as well. Taking a look at uh, Tolkien's life and his connection to his work, um, actually, rather than go through the step-by-step, uh, -step, the uh, important elements of his life, I'd rather just refer you to Humphrey Carpenter's biography of Tolkien because um, you'll find a lot more detail there than I would have time to go through today. And I want to focus in this lecture on um, the connections that I see between his life and the works that, uh, that he produced. So um, the other place that I would send you for additional information on Tolkien and his, um, his upbringing and um, the, the work that he did would be to Peter Jackson's extended edition DVDs because he's done an awful lot of research and he's uh, gathered together people that knew Tolkien and interviewed them and there's a lot of information that's available uh, on those DVDs as well. Let me just start by saying that Tolkien was born January 3rd, 1892, which would have meant that his 111st birthday would have been in 2003. So I know I celebrated January 3rd, 2003 by raising a glass to, to Tolkien on his 113rd birthday. Had he lived, he obviously would have um, passed the old Took and Bilbo by 2035. Unfortunately, he died in 1970. But um, the, the important elements, um, one of the most important elements for his overall life was his wife, Edith. And we can see the reflection of their um, romance, their love affair in Tolkien's work, uh, most especially in Baron and Luthien, but also reflected in Aragorn and Arwen, the story of Aragorn and Arwen. Going back to Baron and Luthien, um, on Tolkien's grave and also on Edith's grave, they're buried in the same grave site, Tolkien has identified Edith as his Luthien and he's identified himself as Baron. So obviously um, her influence on him was great. He talks about how she uh, sang and danced for him in the woods and that translated into uh, elements of the Baron and Luthien story and also of the Aragorn and Arwen story. But there were other important influences on Tolkien's life and in fact probably male friendships were more important to Tolkien not more important than family, but uh, most important to Tolkien uh, in terms of his uh, literary life. And it begins with the TCBS, which is the Tea Club Barovian Society. And um, they all had determined that they were going to um, enlist in the service and, and serve in World War I, uh, all of them. And one particular letter that he got from uh, one member of the TCBS, I think had a great impact on Tolkien. And it was when he, um, uh, when they were over there on the front lines and he received a, a letter from Je um, Jeffrey Bosch Smith in which he said, my chief consolation is that if I'm scuppered tonight, I am on duty in a few minutes, there will still be a member of the great TCBS to voice what I dreamed of and what we all agreed upon. And um, later on he says, may God bless you, my dear John Ronald, and may you say the things I have tried to say um, long after I'm not there to say them. May you say the things I have tried to say. And I think that Tolkien did try to do that for all of the members of the TCBS. If we take a look at the list of the members of the TCBS, uh, John Ronald and Christopher Wiseman were the only two that survived World War I.
um, Robert Quilter uh, Gilson and Jeffrey Bosch Smith, the one who wrote him this particular letter, uh, both were killed in World War I. And uh, Tolkien then sort of took on a lot of responsibility to, um, to say the things that they all wanted to say, to be creative, to um, uh, reverence fantasy and, uh, and poetry, and to write the kind of stories that they enjoyed and um, that he didn't think existed in the modern world. And so that particular first group of young men, uh, good friendships, um, I think influenced him all the rest of his life. He started writing the Baron and Luthien story, the Arendelle story. He started writing the Silmarillion at this particular time. He was developing languages. And he, through his uh, association with the TCBS, he decided he also wanted to be a poet. And you'll notice that in many of Tolkien's uh, works, there's a lot of poetry that he himself has written that is um, different in style based on the different people that are supposed to have, or the different groups of people like hobbits or elves or dwarves that are supposed to have created those particular poems. So poetry was a lifelong interest of Tolkien's as well. In World War I, Tolkien was in um, the Lancaster Fusiliers, and his job was to uh, train horses uh, for the cavalry, and uh, you know, it was break, break in the horses so that they could be used. And I think that's one place where he got uh, the great love of horses um, that we'll see in the Rohirrim and in the Ride of the Rohirrim. It's been said often that World War I was the last war in which cavalry really um, played a role. And this was something that uh, Tolkien was very familiar with and was dear to his heart. So he um, immortalized it through the Rite of the Rohirrim in Lord of the Rings. The most important of all of these uh, male groups was undoubtedly the Inklings. And this is the group that met on Tuesday mornings at the Eagle and Child. They called it the Burden Baby or the Burden Babe. And they also met in um, C.S. Lewis's rooms on Thursday evenings. But this particular group of men, J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, uh, Lewis's uh, brother, War Warry, they called him, uh, Owen Barfield, um, uh, Havard Dyson, and eventually Charles Williams, um, all got together and um, shared their uh, the works that they were wor that they were writing themselves. So C.S. Lewis read aloud from his works. Tolkien read um, the Lord of the Rings to this particular group, you know, a chapter at a time. They were supposed to be critiquing each other, uh, giving positive feedback, but also making suggestions for improvement. Tolkien, of course, listened politely to all of the critiques and then didn't change much of anything uh, in his own writing. So um, it was important to him to read this aloud, to get feedback, uh, but he still pretty much wrote all of his own works himself. I want to show you just a picture of um, the Burden Babe. This is, you can, if you go, if you travel to Oxford, there's the Eagle and Child. Actually, here's another, perhaps a little bit better picture of it, uh, where you can see the, um, the opening, the door, uh, a little bit better. If you go, if you travel to Oxford, you can still find the Eagle and Child, and in the back they have a, um, uh, an area that wasn't exactly where the Inklings met, but they've put up a lot of memorabilia and um, uh, some information about um, the Inklings and the works that they published and the friendship that they had um, that was very important to Tolkien. Um, the other important uh, role that he played, of course, was um, as a professor, as an Oxford Don. Um, he was a linguist. He was a philologist, which meant that he studied languages and the way in which language changed over the course of years and, and how other languages being introduced influenced that particular language. He, um, of course, knew Old English, uh, translated the Beowulf uh, poem himself, Middle English. He knew Norse, Finnish, Welsh, and he developed his own languages, um, Elvish, two different versions of Elvish, in fact, uh, Quenya and Sindarin, uh, the 
the uh, versions of the elves that left Middle Earth and went to Valinor and then came back, and the uh, elvish for those elves that stayed in Middle Earth. And then also, um, you can see the influence of the uh, Quenya elves, or the elves that spoke Quenya, on the elves that, that spoke Sindarin. So he didn't just create a language that was a static language. He created a language that changed with the history of the world. And um, so I, I think that shows even more imagination and um, uh, creative ability on Tolkien's part than just creating a language in and of itself. Of course, he was an expert in Old and Middle English. Um, that's what he taught at Oxford. Uh, I'm told that uh, when he started his uh, class on Beowulf, he would walk in the very first day and he would start reading to the class from Beowulf, Watwe Gardenum, Indagam Yorum, etc. They wouldn't understand any of the language. They hadn't learned Old English yet, but the students would be sitting on the edge of their seats because of the fact that Tolkien was so engaged. He knew what he was talking about. He knew the story he was telling. And so you could hear a pin drop as he read to them from Old English and got them interested in wanting to know what this story was all about. Obviously, he had to grade tests. He had to deal with students um, in office hours, et cetera. And the grading of tests is important because of that one blank page uh, that one student left for him that Tolkien himself wrote on, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And then, of course, he had to figure out what a hobbit was and that was the impetus for the book, The Hobbit, which eventually led to The Lord of the Rings. So um, there's an interconnection between his professional life and his, um, his life as a creative author, his, his life as a sub-creator as well. And of course, Tolkien was very famous for many of his critical works. His um, article on Beowulf was considered one of the most important articles on the Old English poem, The Monsters and the Critics, was the, um, the work that he wrote that he wrote in uh, 1936. He also did the definitive Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Now that's in Middle English. He and, and Gordon edited Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, so they glossed it. They um, you know, explained terms. They chose uh, the in particular interpretations uh, that they wanted to uh, present in that particular edition. Um, Tolkien also was working with Gordon on the Ancran Wies, but that got abandoned because Gordon moved to a different um, to a different university. And then Tolkien, over the course of his pr um, professional career, also translated into modern English, so that we could understand them a little bit better. Uh, Pearl, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and Sir Orfeo. And even with Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, he has a um, prose version of it, but he also has a poetry version of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight that he translated into uh, modern English. So he's not only um, uh, a scholar in these areas, but he's also helping to make Old and Middle Eng he helped to make Old and Middle English more access accessible to modern readers, to um, those of us who aren't experts in languages and you know, didn't necessarily know the older versions of, of English to begin with. I'd like to talk a little bit about his personal life, and most especially his family and his children. Uh, Tom Bombadil uh, came about because Priscilla, his daughter, his one daughter, his fourth child, um, had a doll that she called Tom Bombadil. And when Tolkien was writing um, The Lord of the Rings, at one point Priscilla had said, you know, I think I would like to see uh, Tom Bombadil in the story. So Tolkien um, agreed and wrote a section. It, it actually is a section that many scholars d think isn't as important as the rest of the story. I don't agree with that. I think the Tom Bombadil story was very well worked into the overall theme of the ring and power, and uh, the fact that, that the ring has no power over Tom Bombadil is very important. Um, but so he, he took something that was just a suggestion of his daughter's, let's put this uh, doll uh, character in the story, but then he made it a serious character and he built um, many of the points that he wanted to make about power and the ring itself 
uh, around this particular character that he had um, that he had included in the story for his daughter. Rover Random, which wasn't published until um, uh, after he after his death. In fact, many many years after his death was actually written in 1925 uh, for his son Michael who had a little lead dog that had gotten lost and so Tolkien to help him to feel better had written a, the story about a dog that gets lost and, and then goes through all of these uh, magical transformations and eventually comes back um, uh, for, his, uh, for that particular son. This was his second son, Michael. Uh, the letters that he wrote to Christopher, he, he ended up uh, sending his son Christopher, who was in the uh, British Air Force in World War II, many, many chapters from um, The Lord of the Rings for Christopher to critique. So he was kind of like uh, included in the Inklings, uh, but from a distance in that respect. But also many of his letters to Christopher have been published in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, and they give us insight into um, uh, what his thinking was when he was writing these particular passages, what he was trying to say. So they become very important in understanding the man himself. Um, Tolkien's um, home life was very simple. He didn't believe in having a, a lot of um, uh, you know, washers and dryers and dishwashers. And you know, he, he kind of preferred to uh, do things the old fashioned way. And um, one of the things that he was particularly interested in doing was um, hiking. We have a picture here of uh, Tolkien, probably when he was out on one of his hikes. And um, that ability to see the world in a new way, um, to experience nature, to bring nature, um, the importance of nature into his works, I think is uh, seen throughout all of Tolkien's works. And undoubtedly, uh, much of that reverence for nature or that um, kind of curiosity about what's around the next bend, um, what would happen if I went through uh, this gate rather than the other gate, all of that, I think, also comes from um, Tolkien's wanderings and the fact that he just loved to just go out and explore the countryside. I'd like to show you a picture of Tolkien's desk. You know, for some reason, when I saw this, this is now in Priscilla's house. Uh, when I saw this, I ended up thinking that it was such a small desk to have written such a large uh, epic on, uh, and yet apparently that's where he wrote most of um, The Lord of the Rings and much of Silmarillion as well. Um, I'd like to now talk about Tolkien's connection with the modern world, and um, he actually reacted against the modern world in many ways. Uh, Tolkien has been known to say that he thought that real literature stopped with the Renaissance. In fact, I'm not sure that he would go as far as the Renaissance. Probably Chaucer would be the, um, the author that he would have thought was a great author uh, uh, from the British history, and he probably didn't want to go beyond that. But um, one of the things that he most regretted in modern literature was the sense of loss of things that were natural. Um, uh, power coming from wind or from water, like uh, mills that would uh, create uh, power to, to grind the, the corn through the water. Uh, we see that in, in Hobbiton um, and with the changes that, takes pla that take place in Hobbiton between the beginning of The Lord of the Rings and the end when we have the scouring of the Shire. Um, a lot of that is Tolkien's commentary on how he sees uh, how he saw uh, Britain itself changing and getting away from a pastoral, more simple life to an industrialized nation. And, and he was um, bewailing that particular change in, in Britain. The modern world had, uh, was dealing with a loss of meaning. The, the concept that um, when, we, when Darwin introduced um, uh, evolution and we have this conflict between the creation story and evolution that if we believe the evolution theory then um, then religion doesn't seem to, to be as needed or doesn't play as much of a role in modern man's life. So there's a sense that there's a loss of meaning. And the modern world reacted to this loss of meaning in two different ways. 
the first reaction was kind of like the depth of our fall. In other words, the meaning is lost in G. Uh, woe is us. You know, um, there's not a whole lot that we can do except for feel sorry for ourselves. And we might find this represented by, by James Joyce in the modern world. The other reaction that the modern world had to this sense of loss of meaning was that the meaning was still there um, or it was still possible, but we need to find it ourselves. In other words, uh, that we have to go on a, a quest ourselves. And this might be represented by, by D.H. Lawrence. Or it might be a suggestion that we need to find meaning in something other than religion. In other words, uh, belief in God isn't necessarily as important as belief in love or belief in um, mankind or something like that. And those are reactions that I think Tolkien is, is responding against in the works that he's creating. Um, he wants to suggest that the meaning is still there and um, that, in fact, uh, the meaning that we've always found in religion uh, still can be found even in the modern world. Tolkien, as a uh, 20th century um, author, probably is best explored by Tom Shippey's book, Author of the Century. Um, and his claim is that Tolkien reflects um, uh, the 20th century perhaps better than other authors. But he also talks about Tolkien's popularity, his influence, the fact that he, um, through his writing of The Lord of the Rings and the popularity of The Lord of the Rings, basically introduced an entire new genre to uh, modern literature, the genre of fantasy literature, which is paired now with science fiction. Um, and that because of that kind of influence, Tolkien should be seen as the author of the century. Actually, there have been polls that have been um, conducted in Britain. And uh, Tolkien comes out on top of even Jane Austen and not Shakespeare, of course, but um, uh, other novelists as uh, in terms of most important novelist. Uh, Tolkien represents many modern themes. Uh, and we'll see this uh, throughout the fantasy work, Lord of the Rings especially. But we have the wasteland in Mordor. Um, and this is something that the 20th century was very, very well, well aware of. And most modern um, artists were having to deal with how can we um, ignore the fact that we are making a wasteland of our world? And um, how can we deal with that particular situation? Well, Tolkien, of course, does it through fantasy and through uh, establishing um, what can be done to a land like Mordor um, when it's not uh, properly taken care of. And then um, how can we reverse that when we have the defeat of Sauron and you have uh, Aragorn coming back and uh, reestablishing the, the realm of Gondor. The Heart of Darkness was um, an important book by Joseph Conrad that was written at the turn of the century, and it influenced all of the 20th century. That concept that there is evil within us is something that no modern writer can ignore, can get away from. And Tolkien does reflect that in uh, especially the quest that Frodo takes on, and the fact that without Gollum, uh, at the end of that quest, it might not have been accomplished. In other words, that there is a heart of darkness within all of us, and Gandalf recognizes it. He refuses the ring. Galadriel refuses the ring. Aragorn doesn't want to have anything to do with the ring. All because they are uh, aware of their own hearts of darkness and, um, and are trying to protect themselves from being of danger to other people. The need for alliances, um, most especially in the 20th century. And, and when Tolkien starts writing The Lord of the Rings, it's the time period of World War II. And so the alliances that were formed to battle against not only Hitler in, in uh, Europe, but also against Japan, Hirohito in Japan, um, on, on for the United States on what we would call the, the Western Front, um, then both of in both of those battles, there, it was important that we join together with other countries in alliances to fight a common fight. And so that need for everyone, rather than separating ourselves into different countries and protecting our borders against everybody else, there was a need for um, countries to unite together. And I think Tolkien's reacting against the whole idea of isolationism. 
We'll see that in the Silmarillion. We'll also see it um, most especially in the Lord of the Rings. And he has a, a sense of responsibility to everyone, um, third world countries, uh, probably coming from the fact that he was born in a Commonwealth country, South Africa, and also at the end of the Commonwealth time period. And so at least some of the ideals of the Commonwealth of improving the lot of all peoples in the world that, that if you happen to be a have country, that you do have responsibilities for the have not countries um, to bring their civilizations, not necessarily their religion. That was part of uh, the Commonwealth um, desire for um, conquest of other countries as well. But at least bring their standard of living up, um, um, uh, provide roads, hospitals, things that we could expect for, as, as basic human uh, needs. And uh, Tolkien, I think, probably bought into that responsibility for all concept. And we see that in uh, The Hobbit that we'll talk about um, pretty soon. The um, other themes for uh, in the 20th century that Tolkien is focusing on are the importance of friendship. Um, that seems to be the one theme that, that nobody misses in all of The Lord of the Rings, that uh, the friendship between Frodo and Sam and between all of the members of the, the fellowship is um, absolutely crucial in the forming of the character of all of those characters, uh, all of those um, various individual people. I would say people, but some of them are hobbits, and some of them are elves, and some of them are dwarves. So I guess characters is a better term to use. Um, but that necessity of uh, friendship we can see reflected in Tolkien from the, the TCBS club, also in the Inklings, that support group concept or the idea of not trying to go it alone, but um, establishing uh, friends and each bringing their own, each bringing his own um, uh, skills and, and uh, expertise to a common uh, quest or a common goal. Honor and integrity, again, uh, very important to Tolkien virtues. These are all things that Tolkien might have argued were missing from the 20th century that he saw more illustrated in the literature of the uh, middle uh, of, the, of old English and also of Middle English that um, that he was wishing were more uh, illustrated in the realism of the 20th century, and the idea that every man is necessary, that there's a role for um, every person, no matter how small he is, which is one of the reasons perhaps that the hobbits are diminutive. And the need for fantasy, and, and I want to talk about um, Tolkien's on, on fairy stories particularly, uh, and how he justified fantasy, how he um, actually is bewailing the loss of fantasy, or what he would call imagination in um, much of modern literature. And he was suggesting that um, the modern world itself, and most especially modern literature, needed to go back to its own roots and rediscover fantasy and uh, utilize it more in the literature of today. So let's go on to On Fairy Stories. Um, this, this was originally written as a speech. It was the Andrew uh, Lang speech that he gave. Um, but then he eventually wrote it down and um, had it published. He added a little bit at when, he, when he'd written it down. Um, but he was, in a sense, defending the kind of literature that, that he himself was writing. Um, at that point, he was writing The Hobbit. And um, I think also trying to introduce to the modern world what he thought was missing, which was, again, mostly imagination and that concept of fancy and that ability to see things in a new way. Um, I'd like to start where Tolkien started in the uh, essay that he wrote on fairy stories with the idea of what is fairy. In other words, he saw it as an actual realm, kind of like a, a parallel universe um, that many of us can't see or aren't uh, aware of, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't exist at the same time and place that our own real world exists. And he ended up, um, he has, I think, two very important um, uh, quotes from On Fairy Stories that talk to us about what fairy is. The first one is, 
Fairy contains many things besides elves and fays, and besides dwarves, witches, trolls, giants, or dragons. It holds the seas, the sun, the moon, and the sky, and the earth, and all things that are in it, tree and bird, water and stone, wine and, uh, that should be bread, not wine and red, uh, and ourselves, mortal men, when we are enchanted. So the idea of um, that we are part of fairy, that we are part of this fantasy world, uh, I think is something that he's introducing uh, back into literature. The other quote that, he, that, he, um, that I particularly like from On Fairy Stories is where he talks about the extremes of um, joy and sorrow that we find in fairy. He says, fairy is a perilous land, and in it are pitfalls for the unwary and dungeons for the overbold. The realm of fairy story is wide and deep and high and filled with many things. All manner of beasts and birds are found there, shoreless seas and stars uncounted, beauty that is an enchantment and an ever-present peril, uh, both joy and sorrow as sharp as swords. And I think that in that respect, he's not trying to um, emulate the Renaissance that, that um, advocated for the golden mean in terms of e emotional um, not being too happy or, or allowing yourself to get too depressed. Uh, but having some sort of control over your emotions. Uh, Tolkien would suggest that um, a life lived fully will, will embrace great joy, but it'll also um, need to be able to be open to great sorrow as well. I think this will explain for us a lot of the endings to his works, because if we take a look at the last line of The Lord of the Rings and also The Silmarillion, I think you'll find that there's a kind of bittersweet quality that suggests that there's both a great joy in coming to the end of this story, but also a sense of sorrow or loss that we're dealing with at exactly the same time. Going back to Tolkien's view of uh, fantasy, he also said that there were two main reasons that we would want to, um, that we would want to um, um, write fantasy or read fantasy. And uh, the quote that he uses, I'm going to go on to that, he says, the magic of fairy is not an end in itself. Its virtue is in its operations. Among these are the satisfaction of certain primordial human desires. So by calling them primordial human desires, he's suggesting that innately we all have these um, desires within us and that fantasy uh, can um, fulfill those desires in ways that realism cannot. And the two primordial human desires we have, one of these is the desire to survey the depths of space and time. So that ability to either manipulate space or time uh, so that we can understand it a little bit more. And Tolkien, of course, does this most especially through the elves and the idea that they are immortal and man is mortal and hobbits are mortal. And so that contrast between immortality and mortality is one way in which we explore time and the way in which time passes to the different groups uh, tells us a little bit about, um, uh, well, perhaps the gift of man, which is what Tolkien calls death, or um, the, the, uh, the idea that having a limited uh, lifespan isn't necessarily uh, a curse to man, but is something that um, is a benefit, because if we were immortal, as the elves were, we might end up suffering loss after loss and find ourselves um, dealing with more sorrow than we need to in our own limited lifespan. He also um, explores space, and we'll talk about that in Smith of Wooden Major and also in um, Leaf by Niggle, because he uh, suggests that through imagination you can see a, f a tree within a forest as well as seeing the forest as a separate forest. In other words, that you can be both inside a landscape and perceiving it from the outside at the same time. Or with Smith of Wooden Major that you can uh, hold a flower in your hand and see it up close as if it's in your hand and also see it as if it's a long ways away where it was that you uh, picked that particular flower. So he's, uh, he will be exploring time and space. The other um, human desire that we have, he says another is, as will be seen, to hold communion with other living things. And there we would have his impetus for creating the Ents, actually elves and dwarves and hobbits, even our other living things. He doesn't tend to include a whole lot of animals. We do have Garm 
and um, the mare and the dragons uh, in uh, the dragon, I should say, in Farmer Giles of Ham and Smog in The Hobbit, but he doesn't uh, usually include a whole lot of animals either. Uh, but there is an interaction with other human beings or other living beings. And it's interesting that when Tolkien says that, he's not just thinking of animals, but he's also thinking of trees. And trees are among Tolkien's favorite things. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about that comes from On Fairy Stories are the four purposes that he develops at, at some length in the essay, uh, the speech that he gave on, on Fairy Stories, and those are fantasy recover recovery, uh, escape, and consolation. And he defines all of these uh, in the essay, and I think it's important to take a look at them in a little bit more detail. So fantasy he defines as imagination or what the Renaissance called fancy, that um, ability to see beyond the reality of the world to some kind of inner reality or um, possible reality. Uh, in other words, what could be or should be rather than just what is, that concept. Tolkien uh, talks about our need for arresting strangeness. In other words, we need to be surprised by our world. We shouldn't be... Um, uh, we shouldn't become so uh, mundane or, or um, so mired in the humdrum that we can't look around and still be surprised by nature or by uh, people or by our world. And, and there I think he's talking about surprised in a good way, not surprised and, and appalled by what's happening in our world. But um, still find beauty, still find uh, wonder in nature. And that connects with his concept of recovery, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But also as part of fantasy, and he, this is the one uh, aspect of uh, fairy stories that he spends the most time on. Uh, he talks about um, being a sub-creator. In other words, being a writer or being an artist that um, can recreate or use his imagination to create a whole world or in this, the situation of Niggle, simply just the tree and the landscape behind the tree. Um, but uh, more importantly, in terms of Tolkien and his creation of Middle Earth, um, create a whole world with its history, with its languages, with its different peoples and their interconnections, etc., the same way that the world was created. So he suggests that um, this is an instinct of ours, that it's a way in which we are like God. Remember, he is uh, a very strong Catholic, so he has a strong belief in God and a belief in the uh, creation story as opposed to evolution that I talked about a minute ago. Um, and he, he, he was suggesting that even if this sub-created world isn't realistic in the same way that we perceive our own world to be realistic, as long as it's consistent within itself, as long as the things that for us would be fantastic or uh, magical uh, are consistent within themselves, uh, within his world, then the sub-creator has created uh, a valuable world. And the example that he gives, he was talking about the importance of the adjective. And when we um, were able to separate green from grass, and uh, then put in uh, other adjectives like red grass or yellow grass or green sun or something like that. That's where imagination comes into play. And that's where the sub-creator can change the reality of the world. But what he needs to do is he needs to um, create some place that has a green sun where having a green sun is consistent with the, uh, with the laws of that particular world. In other words, it makes sense. It's, it doesn't stand out to us as something that's illogical or unbelievable. It's something that we accept because of this inner consistency that fantasy can provide, even when providing this arresting strangeness, which may be in the form of magic or uh, different beings for us to interact with that we have never interacted with in our own real world. Recovery, I think, is one of uh, Tolkien's most important concepts, and it has to do with the regaining of wonder. And um, I always like to, to talk to the class about when my daughter was um, one year old, and I had to keep taking her to the, um, the babysitters, 
and the babysitter had this huge tree in her front yard and for some reason every time we walked up to the door or we were walking up to the door Laura my daughter had to stop and touch the tree and look at the tree and see the leaves and was just fascinated with the bark of the tree uh, with the fact that this was a living tree and for that for, for me that particular incident um, was what helped me recover the concept of tree. It helped me recover uh, a love of nature and it made me start looking at other trees and seeing the differences between trees and the differences in the uh, texture of their bark and the uh, shape of their leaves, etc. And yet, you know, if she hadn't been fascinated with that tree, I probably could have walked up to that door, you know, uh, 30, 40, 50 times and not really looked at the tree and Tolkien is suggesting that we do that all the time that we walk past flowers we walk past nature we walk past things uh, that are absolutely fascinating but we don't take the time to stop and really look at them and uh, recover a sense of wonder that they're alive that they're um, that they exist in this world and that was one of the main points that he thought um, fa fairy stories or fantasy literature could provide for us. The story that he gives, or the example that he gives, is the word morifoc. And morifoc, if you look at it, you think, oh, what a strange word, word that is. Uh, wonder what in the world it means. And yet, uh, eventually, he explains to us that it's just the reflection of the word coffee room. And so it's something that's very familiar to us, and yet it, we've had this arresting strangeness, this, this recovery of that particular concept by seeing it a new way, seeing it as a reflection. Escape is the criticism that many modern uh, critics of fantasy literature uh, lay on fantasy literature. They say it's escapist literature. But Tolkien was defending fairy stories and fantasy in general by saying, if you're a prisoner, why shouldn't you think about escape? If you don't like the world that you're in, if the world that you're in is not a, a good place to be, then wanting to escape is actually the same thing to do as opposed to being something that, um, that you should be ashamed of. Um, consolation is what he wants to provide through fantasy. He talks about the eucatastrophe, which is that sudden turn or that sudden joy that was unexpected that uh, resolves the ending of the story, you know, and they lived happily ever after uh, is, is um, kind of a poor uh, concept of that sense of um, um, happiness that where things might have gone wrong, but they turned at the end and through some miraculous um, uh, situation, everything came out all right and, we've, and we get that sense of joy. Uh, he talks about joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant as grief. And there you've got that, that, um, that juxtaposition again between uh, great joy and sorrow or grief. What Tolkien wanted to do was he wanted to write a mythology for England. And he, um, he accomplished that in writing The Silmarillion. We want to talk in more depth about The Silmarillion because it was a huge undertaking where he was including the mythologies that we're familiar with from other cultures, but also writing his own mythology. He also wanted to write the kinds of stories that he liked to read. He couldn't find them in modern literature, so he decided that he had to write them himself. Um, the kinds of heroes that we end up seeing in, in um, Tolkien's works are, um, the kinds of traditional heroes are more like the Beowulf hero. We would see that in Aragorn and in Bard and in Gandalf and Theoden. Um, characters like that. The modern heroes are also represented in Tolkien's work. We have Frodo and Sam who are very modern heroes. We also have um, Farmer Giles, Smith of Witten Major, um, uh, Niggle, you know, is a, is a very good example of a, a modern, um, not overly heroic character, everyman kind of character who nevertheless can do heroic things. Um, Tolkien's popularity was something that always embarrassed him a little bit. He didn't really like the Frodo lives, the cult, uh, the cult classic popularity of Lord of the Rings, um, and and yet it's what uh, uh, got him noticed and got his work translated into uh, so many different languages. 
But what's important about Tolkien is that he established a new genre of literature. In other words, that this is, I think, one of the reasons that he is considered the author of the century. Um, I hope that you will enjoy the class. I hope that you will enjoy the readings in the class. Uh, if you've read them before or if, if you're starting them for the first time, uh, I welcome you to the class and let's enjoy it.